So hello everyone and welcome to Ensuring Learning Guided Pathways and Learning Outcomes Assessment. Uh, I am Dr. Sarah Harris. I'm a member of the uh, Academic Senate for California Community Colleges Guided Pathways Task Force and I'm also a Pathways Liaison and an Outcomes Assessment Coordinator and a Curriculum Coordinator on my campus, the College of the Sequoias. Uh, so thank you so much for having us. We're excited to uh, chat with you here today. Uh, we also have have Jeffrey Hernandez, who's one of our Senate Pathways uh, Task Force leads from East Los Angeles College. Hi, Jeffrey. And we have Stephanie Curry, who's also, again, a member of that task force, and she's with Reedley College. Uh, Jeannie May is not able to join us today. She had a time conflict, but we miss her, and we'll soldier on uh, without her. So you may have seen her in the program, but she's, she's not able to join us today. Uh, all right. So let's... Go ahead and get rolling. Uh, you've probably seen the description of the session in your program, uh, but just in case, today uh, you're going to hear from some members of the statewide Senate Guided Pathways Task Force. So we have kind of come together to talk with you a little bit about learning outcomes assessment and how it fits within the Guided Pathways framework, particularly that fourth pillar of ensuring learning. We're going to talk about resources for integrating assessment throughout pathways. Uh, we'll give you some cool examples of how that's happening at a couple of colleges. And then also about how the integration of learning outcomes assessment can lead to strong and equitable learning outcomes for students. So uh, you'll hear a little bit about the task force and the work that we're doing. And then we're gonna get into some cool examples and hopefully just have a lot of dialogue and discussion um, with you all. And so before we get started, we're interested to know how many of the folks we have with us today are involved with Guided Pathways work on your campus. So if you are, involved with that pathways work in some way would you please just uh raise your hand or use a party reaction if you want that's fun too but let's just see how many folks we have with us who are doing that work awesome love those numbers going up to partiers hello partiers i love it uh yeah it looks like about dozen, 20 or so of us, those reactions do go away pretty fast now. So that's a bummer, but cool. All right, excited to have you all with us. Um, and so particularly for folks who are doing the work, the examples and the resources that we're going to share uh, hopefully will be helpful for you as you're thinking about this kind of integration uh, work on your own campuses. But please feel free to chime in with uh, examples or ideas for how things are happening where you are. We're excited to hear about those. Um, all right, so just a brief overview for those who might not be familiar of the statewide about the statewide Senate's uh, Guided Pathways Task Force. Um, we are a group uh, with several goals. Primarily, we are in working on the integration of pathways into the Senate's structures. So we are a task force. We won't exist forever. At some point, the work of pathways will uh, exist kind of throughout the state statewide Senate committees. Um, and many of you are maybe doing similar work right now on your own campuses. Uh, we look at evaluating pathways and placement. You may have seen uh, some recent papers from the statewide Senate about AB 705 and how that's kind of proceeding throughout uh, the state. Uh, we've been working on projects related to that, analyzing data about uh, placement for students. We work to amplify equity work, which you're going to hear us talk a little bit about today, to focus on ensuring learning. Again, that really critical component, right, of um, the work that we do, all of us for students. And then assess and improve program review and related processes. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we feel like outcomes assessment fits within potentially program review or similar processes that you probably already have and are doing uh, on your campuses. Okay, so that's the task force. Anything, Jeff or Stephanie, you want to add about that? Well, I, I think that covers it. I think, um, mm -hmm. it, the, and this, uh, I think, as you point out, this sort of integration into our existing pra uh, practice at the state level is, is what we're all looking at um, at the local level too, particularly um, by the end of next year. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. All right. 
Uh, so on to guided pathways in general. Again, we have a lot of folks who are doing that work, so I'm going to be quick uh, with this slide. But if you're not familiar, guided pathways is really a kind of a framework um, that exists to sort of orient all of our work at our, at our colleges and our districts around student success and student goals, right? It's about designing with the students in mind. Um, and so rather than think of it as a separate initiative, we like to think about it as a way of organizing our work, right? Or reorganizing it in many cases in order to kind of focus on students and their learning. Something that I think most of us as outcomes assessment professionals would uh, recognize, hopefully, right, that, that particular goal and get excited about. So the four pillars, of course, uh, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. You have the sort of display there. Uh, but in terms of where we are at the statewide level with kind of the Pathways Initiative, we're rolling towards the end of the funding. We're in, I think, year three now. Uh, and four, Stephanie, thank you, year four. See, woof. <laughs> I've lost all track of, you know, linear time, I think, in this current state that we're in, year four. So uh, every year, your campus is going to be doing a, a scale of adoption report that um, talks about the implementation of the design components, components the four pillars of pathways uh, at scale, where you are in terms of uh, how far along in scaling your various adoptions. I mentioned this because this report typically goes through your academic senate, your senate president needs to sign off on it. So if you're not sure about where your campus or your district is with pathways, there should be some kind of report that will let you know what the campus is working on and where you are at various stages of implementation. You can follow up with your senate or, or with your pathways groups on campus to sort of learn a little bit about that work. Uh, final pathways funds from the chancellor's Sarah, office. Sarah, can I just yes, please, yeah. Stephanie. Go ahead. I just want to I just want to point in. Uh, there are specific questions on the SOAA or the scale of adoption that we do that are about outcome assessment and assessment of, of those other things. So if you're not in conversation with your credit pathways group about what you guys are doing on there and what scale you guys are at for that, that's a really good opportunity because there actually are questions specifically in there about outcomes. That's great, Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, and jump in any time, either of you. Stop me. You know, I, I, Sarah, I want to just chime in. You know, um, in some ways, it does feel like like three years in, right? Because we didn't get the funding till the end of the first year, right? So a lot of our activities, you know, you know, it seems like boy, it's would be judged in four years and three years. But unfortunately, I think we're all seeing this with learning outcomes assessment in other areas. Um, a lot of the guided pathways of start of work yeah, has been ongoing, and and now we're again you know, ramping that up and for, having further integration. That's true. And it will continue to be ongoing, which I think we'll, we'll talk about, right? Uh, but in terms of funding, we know that the final funds will be allocated from the state uh, in July of 21, the end of this year, uh, and then they need to be expended by June of next year. So a lot of campuses have been reserving some of that funds, right, in order to, to continue to expend it. And so it may be that on your campus, you continue to have funding uh, through next year. Again, it just depends on what kind of a adoption plan uh, folks have, have been using. Um, any other chime in about funds, folks? That's that's pretty much the nuts yeah. and bolts there. The other thing is, you know, talk to your people. If there's a project you want to do to help, uh, you know, faculty do assessments and do things like that, talk to your guided pathways people about creating some sort of funding source for it, because there is funding, you know, for each of those colleges, depending on what they've already spent. It's, it's a good opportunity to ask. And if you're looking for some sort of project to be able to fund, it's an opportunity to have a discussion about that. Absolutely. And as we'll see, especially when we talk about ensuring learning, right, uh, outcomes assessment is a natural fit and you probably have a lot of great assessment projects that are going to fit neatly uh, in that particular pillar, although it's infused throughout. So uh, one last thing I wanted to highlight is that in the Chancellor's Office own sort of FAQ about uh, pathways initiatives and funding, they refer to it as an iterative process, right? Planning, analyzing, reflection, revision of plans. So so we're never necessarily all the way done with pathways. We're always kind of iterating uh, and thinking through our plans and improving them and collecting data. And again, if you're an assessment person, that should sound familiar because yes. guess what? <laughs> <laughs> That's how outcomes assessment works, right? We're always kind of collecting data and iterating and improving instruction and all those things. So pathways in that way is very, very similar. 
Well, and we've actually talked about, um, we use student learning outcomes as an example of how to do that an outcomes assessment. Like we're talking about like this, we're gonna do this. Well, yeah, we're gonna try it. We're gonna see what we're gonna do. And we're gonna evaluate it like we do in our classrooms and our outcomes and things like that. So we've actually used it as a as a as something similar to what our guided pathways in, uh, processes are doing, working on. Yeah. And that emphasis on continuous quality improvement is is really why it's helpful to think about guide pathways uh, not as a, a, an initiative, but as its framework, a mindset that is is helping um, you know, redesign what we do. Absolutely. Okay. And so to that end, I wanted to briefly pause and talk a little bit about backwards design, because this is a thing I share a lot, uh, just as an example on my own campus, the idea that outcomes can be used to design learning experiences that are intentional, clear, and center on what students can do. Uh, so probably many of you are familiar with this. This is an instructional design kind of concept that's been around for a long time, but just an approach to teaching and curriculum design uh, attributed to Wiggins and McTie, uh, most primarily, and that uh, references in the end of the slides, if, if you would like it, to that book. Um, but most instructional design starts with the content, right? We know when people are thinking about planning a course, they're like, oh, what are the sections in my textbook? And then I'm going to teach those sections, and then I'll give maybe an exam or something, right? And then we move sort of from there. And backwards design says, of course, start the at the other end what's the kind of goal the learning outcome right for your curriculum and then uh what do we need to do to determine whether or not students are meeting that goal what kinds of assessments are appropriate in the classroom and then what content do we need to go over in order to prepare students uh, for that assessment. So we talk about this a lot on my campus. I think it's a really useful framework for understanding how outcomes and how learning goals can guide curriculum and instruction, right? How they should uh, do that. Sarah, I just, I just want to point out, again, this is, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm trained as a librarian, so I'm from the other side of the, you know, the 50% law um, in the non-instructional area. And what we've learned is this design model that we use for outcomes in classes works really well with other areas as well. So student support and some of those other areas. So anything we do with our guided pathways elements, we're always talking about outcomes first. Like what is the outcome of this activity that we want to do? What is the outcome of this? And then we have to try to address how we're going to quantify it, either qualitative or, or quantify it, um, and do that backwards design. And that's really been a shift in our thinking in outside the classroom um, in these areas. And I think we've used this classroom experience of the outcomes to kind of shift our, our experience in that. Absolutely, Stephanie. And that's where I was just going to go, right? So backwards design, or guided yeah. pathways, excuse me, functionally is backwards design for our institutions, right? That's what it is. So if we know it from the classroom, let's pull that out and, and do it at the sort of larger level and at scale at, at the institution. Um, and so if we think about designing with that end in mind in terms of pathways, right, we've got our four pillars, clarify, enter, stay, ensure learning. Uh, and we can think about outcomes as a as a model for how to sort of fit into each of those pillars. So in terms of clarifying the path, if we're designing with that end in mind, program learning outcomes are a clear fit, right? Starting with those uh, outcomes that are clearly tied to students' goals can help students to understand what pathway is most appropriate for them and where they're going to fit in, right? What's my learning goal? What's my career goal? Where is the place that I should kind of start with that? Um, if we're entering the path, we can think about, again, clearly communicating those program goals to help students choose. So if we have really compelling and strong program learning outcomes that make sense to students, then they, they're much more able to choose right a, a pathway or a program that's going to be engaging and interesting to them. And I saw in the chat a little while back, we had a question about, right, our old SLOs feel uncompelling in this new world. Is there any advice on uh, redefining? developing outlines, perhaps with students uh, or uh, local research collaboration. And yes, right, uh, we're going to actually see a couple of examples of that in a little bit here, uh, particularly around um, CTE and using um, kind of community input. But again, right, that idea of the, your program learning outcomes being a place where students can, can clearly see their goals is, I think, a good place to start that conversation. <clears throat> 
Uh, staying on the path means, again, like aligning your course and program learning goals so students can see their progress, right? Again, helping them to stay on the path so that they see where they are and where they need to go so that they can see that they have made progress and get excited about it versus just like, oh, I'm checking boxes, right? No, you've learned important skills, even if you're only kind of part way through and you can come back and pick those skills up again if that's something that you need to do. Uh, and then, of course, ensure learning, right, which is building that learning across your curriculum, measuring student progress to identify and fill any gaps that you might find. And of course, uh, SLO assessment fits most neatly here. I also want to mention that, of course, pillars one through three, particularly if you are on the student services side, uh, uh, service area outcomes are also really critical for this work, right, to make sure that we are serving all of our students, that they have good access to information, um, that they have good supports. All of those things also are really clearly aligned with the pillars of uh, pathways. And Jeffrey, were you going to add? Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. But <laughs> this is the services. Yes, definitely. And you know, I was thinking about how Stephanie was reminding us of the the SOA work that we're doing right now. And and um, one of the things that you, you'll note, right, is that the um, uh, the practices of uh, pillar two in particular, right, aligning with um, um, the sort of student service outcomes that, that you may have at your institutions. Okay. So again, pathways, backwards design for our institutions, just to kind of sum up, uh, although we have our learning outcomes assessments fitting most neatly in pillar four, it, it absolutely impacts all of our areas. Service area outcomes, a critical component of um, all of the pillars, and many guided pathways initiatives can inform and support outcomes assessments. So data coaching, industry advisory groups, curriculum audits, which we are now going to hear about uh, some examples that specific colleges. And so I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. All right, so we, um, I went to talk a little bit about our data coaching model, and I will say that we didn't definitely didn't come up this by ourselves. Um, we have amazing colleagues throughout the state who really helped us out on this. So um, Santa Monica has helped us out. I know Saracosa is doing a data co coaching program. Um, so one of the great things about our system is that we don't have to do things alone. Um, and people are willing to share information and share support on things. Um, and one of those things was our data coaches. Um, and what we found out was when we were doing guided pathways, not only in um, pillar four, but all of our pathways was that we had a lot of data. We didn't know how to use it. We didn't know how to read it. And we didn't know how to disaggregate it to look at the specific populations that we needed to do. Um, and so what we've done is we've created this, this data coaching model. Um, and we also have pathways success teams, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, but what we really wanted to do is facilitate this data analysis discussions. And it's both qualitative and quantitative data, which I think is really key. Um, we wanted somebody to be able to appear, um, because I don't know about you guys, but we have a very small institutional research department. There are colleges out there have huge ones where you can actually get an institutional researcher come and talk to you. It's not that way at my campus. We need to have somebody who can help us out locally and who understands our classes, understands our programs and can support us. Um, so we've created seven data coaches for each one of our pathways. Um, and their job is to work with their success team, but actually look at the data, -to data, facilitate data discussions, looking at different outcomes from different courses, helping people facilitate the conversation about those. Because um, in our program review process, we've asked people like, what's going on with the gender gap in your, in your classroom, in your classes? And they'd say, well, we have a gender gap. And we're like, okay, but what does that mean? Is it disaggregated? How are we looking at different things? And nobody could get into that deeper level discussions about data. It was just more of a surface level. Um, and as we go through, um, we wanna make sure that we actually have those opportunities to have those discussions. And so we have these new data coaches. They're, they're brand new. We just started them this year. Um, but they can also, they can coordinate with the programs, they can coordinate with the counseling, they can coordinate with everybody. So it's a cross-functional discussion rather than the, just the individual faculty member looking at their data and only looking at their data. Um, so it's again, it's taking that data, having the facilitating discussions about that data, but also bringing it out into a larger scale. Um, I will say that ours is um, part of the new program review process, which I'll also be talking about later. Um, and ours, data coaches are required to take a four week class specifically on how to, analyze data, how to discuss data with somebody, how to look at data through an equity lens, and how to disaggregate data and make it meaningful. 
Um, and so it's really important to have that background to be able to have those conversations. Um, so I just want to highlight that as, a, as an effective way to um, bring more people into the, the discussion of outcomes and how we can as a group look at those ideas um, and have somebody facilitate those conversations with us because as we know, um, it's hard to facilitate conversations on data if you don't have that background. Can you clarify the extent to which that includes um, outcomes data versus achievement data? We do a little bit of everything. Uh, right now it's focused on um, outcomes data because they're facilitating mostly program review support. Um, so they are looking at that um, and the SLO support, um, but they're also looking at bigger data as well. Um, and they're looking at, um, when, I, when I show you guys the support teams, the nice thing is they have a data coach, a counselor and a lead faculty member and some other people in the same room together. So they can talk about the outcomes data, but then they can also talk about the data of things that are going to affect that outcome data like the support from counseling and some of those other areas as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I got a question here about reassign time. Yes, they do get reassign time. <clears throat> um, that's one of the things our Guided Pathways money is going to, um, which is if we're going at theirs, they get um, three to four hours a week um, as part of this process. And they can either take it as overload or as um, uh, load, depending on what they, they want to do. Yeah. And the class, who class teaches the class, I'll, I'll put that as well. Uh, we have a math instructor who just happens to be our program of you um, and SLO coordinator right now. Um, so it works out really nice. She and the equity coordinator created the class together um, and they ran the course together. So we had specifically like, how do you do data? And then how do you do data in an equitable uh, framework? Um, and I took the class just because I was interested in it, even though I'm not a data coach and it was absolutely fascinating. Um, so uh, we're hoping to open the class. We did it in the summer. We're hoping to open the class open again to anybody who wants to take it who might be want to be a data coach in the future. Sibia, I have a question. How, yeah. would you, how would you describe the interrelationship between the data coaching and the institutional research team on your campus? Right now, we have an interim researcher right now, so it's, it's, uh, it's still tentative, um, but he's starting to meet with our data coaches regularly. Um, they're starting to create dashboards together about what each pathway wants to have on a dashboard um, and things like that. So it's becoming much more of a, um, a partnership mm -hmm. between inst instruct or in our pathways and our institutional research. Um, mm -hmm. So it's still new and we're still working on it, but it's, it's much more of a, a cooperation rather than us having to go to them every single time and say, we need this data. Wow. Um, so it's more of a, a, a broadening of data opportunities and an um, a further understanding of data. Um, right. Oh, I just got a question about the data class. Uh, would it be available to outsiders? We haven't decided yet. I'm hoping that we can create some sort of class that could be available to more people because it's a, it's a really good class. Um, I will say that we took a lot of the information from Santa Monica and some of the other places as well. So they helped us with some of the examples and things like that. Um, so we're not the only ones who've done this, um, but we are hoping to do something where we can open up a class to other people. Yeah. yeah and I will add that the, um, Pathways Task Force is working on um, some resources that include uh, data, looking at data and interpretation of data um, that are still in process, but that we hope to have available uh, to folks probably next year. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was one question about resources using to come with potential interventions. Um, I will say we're using um, the Starfish data a lot and we're looking at that because it does, um, 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 success scores and you know things like that that we can use. It's using a, we do it, collect all the people that things attend. In that we're doing early alerts in that and some of those other things as well. Um, and then we just use our MIS data for the other stuff. All right. Well, we can answer more questions later, but we'll want to get on to Jeffrey's next slide. All right. <clears throat> yeah. So um, uh, this slide and the next are a couple of examples of integrating our processes, um, you know, if within this guided pathways um, uh, framework, and at the same time doing it um, in a way that is informing uh, learning outcomes. So for example, one of the things that was actually um, emerged separately from our guided pathways effort uh, was the organization or CTE programs 
um, into industry sectors, but we never could really get that off the ground. And so our guided pathways facilitators, um, uh, actually one in particular, really took a lead on this and was able to facilitate um, uh, industry sector meetings in, in these areas. And you see the, the stakeholders involved and, and, and included in this is, you know, as students, as have, have a, a student perspective. And so um, part of what, what What's happened is it kind of builds upon the the work that's already uh, hopefully informing program learning outcomes, the the work in, in the CTE program advisories. But now what we're talking about is a cross functional opportunity where you have related programs, you have multiple departments, you know, that have shared interests. And through this effort, uh, you learn uh, even more about um, the sort of um, skills and and other things that are being looked at uh, by the industry that can inform uh, the the learning outcomes. And uh, yeah, so this is, I think, uh, one very promising effort. And this, of course, also aligns um, it intentionally uh, was made to align with the strong workforce um, framework in terms of industry sectors as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a really good overlap of sorts. And uh, we just, we've just uh, launched it um, in, in this, this past fall, uh, actually summer and fall, and uh, where the second round is, is in store for the spring. Um, but yeah, they're looking at, at things of uh, really how to, how to better uh, situate the programs for job placement is I think next on the horizon. Hopefully we do find opportunities um, or learn of opportunities with respect to, to internships as well. So I know that that question had come up. I, th I think it's pretty, oh, yeah, so it, it, it involves, I, I should, one last point is that um, what they're looking at is outcome data as well as achievement data. So it's kind of a combination of stuff too, as, as similar to what you heard earlier. So next slide. So uh, one of the things that that uh, uh, we're doing at East LA College that again is informing learning outcomes and this in this case, particularly at the course level, is a, a cultural curriculum audit, uh, borrowing uh, from the idea from Long Beach City College, which was presented at at the uh, Curriculum Institute this uh, past past summer, uh, 2020. Um, <clears throat> we've uh, incorporated elements of our community of uh, practice teaching and learning series uh, that uh, our guided pathways of. of, of a facilitator focusing on professional development at um, conducted uh, this past uh, summer as well. So it's, we've turned into a semester uh, long course uh, and it uh, provides an opportunity for instructors to look at their own data. Um, and this includes uh, uh, learning outcome data as well as the achievement data and to look for gaps at the same time that they're getting instruction on culturally responsive uh, teaching, uh, on equity, on anti-racism. Um, and so the idea then uh, through the cultural curriculum audit is instructors are in a sense empowered, right? To address equity challenges that um, are occurring in their classrooms. Uh, now, this first uh, semester that we're launching it in spring, it, the marketing was, was was open and we're gonna continue to uh, market to get participants from as many departments as possible. <clears throat> Hopefully uh, down the road, um, this will turn transform into a um, train the trainer model. But uh, the other piece of what we're hoping uh, to do is as uh, we um, continue our work with uh, our, our meta major completion teams, we call them our CAP, teams for the career and academic pathways uh, uh, moniker um, <clears throat> is that uh, they will with their data, uh, data coaches uh, be looking at um, equity um, uh, gaps in the uh, uh, in the pathways uh, in their in their uh, respective areas and then uh, be able to uh, initiate dialogue right for certain disciplines you know like make sure people are informed and at the same time you know um, help provide awareness of this opportunity to to address it uh, this is not about policing people this is about uh, providing you know more more insight and more support yeah so that's uh um, yeah so it's, it's I'm really excited uh, about this undertaking mm -hmm. oh yeah you know I I have a a, a rough um, the generic template. I'll I'll see if I can look for that and, and upload it into into the into the uh, uh, into the chat uh, later. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll have to look for it a little bit, but I think I'm able to find it. That was an answer to that question. Are there any other questions related to either of these uh, undertakings? 
I see. Uh, oh, in the well, chat, so the question you... about about the uh, example of equity gap in the pathways, um, I, as I said, that that's going to be uh, developing. But the whole idea is to see: um, are, are there perhaps uh, certain courses, for example, where um, uh, students are having a difficulty um, uh, completing, and then looking at that data. Um, you know, uh, disaggregating it um, and then see, oh shoot, this is it, it's primarily affecting uh, students of color, you know, and maybe it looks like it's affecting our black students or our um, Latinx students and, um, or, or, you know, so, so the point is, or women, you know, there, there's, there's ways in which uh, you can look at the data and then say, oh, well, let's, uh, let's look at, at uh, what we can do differently, perhaps, um, you know, and again, this is not, you know, a silver bullet, you know, magic pill sort of thing, but, you know, it provides opportunities and resources for um, instructors who, who uh, want to be aware of this and, and be able to um, explore uh, alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say one of the other things that we're looking at in equity gaps for pathways is who's in those pathways? Um, who chooses those pathways? Because um, we, when we're looking at our, our child development program and our things like that, it's overwhelmingly women and it's overwhelmingly low in, low income. And so how do we, you know, create systems where people can have those conversations and make informed decisions on what what what, what areas they want to do. Um now the child development is amazing. We want to make sure that we have students have opportunity for every every pathway if they want to. And yeah, also, and you know, the gender gap in, in CTE and some of those other things. And just to add to, to all this discussion, I think when we're talking about data and we're talking about the analysis of data, right, to the earlier question, we always want to be looking at um, achievement data in, the, in some kind of context, using that good qualitative data that outcomes assessment can provide to us. Not always, mm -hmm. sometimes we get quant, right? But it, if we get both, then if we see a gap in that achievement data, then we can turn through programs like this to our outcomes assessment data in order to give it some context, mm -hmm. to try to understand what we see happening in that achievement data, right? Because just the gap in the achievement data by itself is not necessary. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be an explanation. Mm -hmm. And so then you need all of this good, good context where instructors are empowered to investigate that data, to make changes to their curriculum if that's necessary, to have good conversations about it, right? Um, so that the data is not punitive, so that it starts the conversation and doesn't end it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, and so that leads us to uh, the start of some of our questions that we wanted to kind of investigate and have dialogue with you all about as part of this mm -hmm. session. Uh, and so the first one is about how integration of guided pathways and learning outcomes assessment can lead to strong and equitable learning outcomes for students. So, so how can that uh, work or be effective? I mean, one of the things that I come back to all of the time is that outcomes, when we present them clearly and we align them to good curriculum and teaching practices, help promote deep learning for students, right? And that's particularly true for, uh, for example, first time students who maybe can't always intuit uh, what it is that the instructor wants or needs or why they might be um, learning content that they're learning, right? Uh, the reasons can seem opaque. Sometimes they seem opaque to me, you know, right? To all of us. So of course they would to students. The more we can, um, show them the, the reasons behind and the goals for their learning, the deeper that learning becomes, which is always kind of the, the goal, I think, for everybody, for faculty, right? We want that deep engagement um, with mm -hmm. students. And so that kind of clarity is, is one way to help promote and, and fill equity gaps. Uh, and I know Stephanie has some additional examples for us. Um, so this is kind of aligned with um, the, the data coaches discussion that we had a few minutes ago, is that outcomes assessment takes holistic support. Um, and that we've done for years where we've done outcome assessment in little pockets, like math looks at math and English looks at English and, you know, the library looks at library and things like that. But we've never really had cross-functional conversations about data and outcomes. Um, and so one of the things we created was these success teams. And as you can see here, the data coach is a, a member of this big idea of a success team. Um, and the idea is that you not only get the, the, the data in there, but you get the people who are interacting with that data together in a room together and have conversations. Um, so we have, again, seven success teams for each one of our pathways. 
Um, we have a data coach, a lead faculty member, counseling lead, and a student navigator in every single one of the pathways. Um, we're also adding intervention specialists, a dean, and then we also have an a &R and financial aid liaison for each one of the pathways. Um, the idea here is that we can look at the data in less of a silo and more of a, a process like how are we all going to help the students succeed in this in addressing this gap. Um, the nice thing is also that um, because we're in pathways, we can see trends across multiple disciplines um, and our success teams meet together with their own success teams, but they also meet with the other success teams. So again, we can look at some trend analysis across our different pathways and see if there's things that we need to make sure are done systemically as an institution and some that are need, needed specifically in that individual pathway. Um, and I'm, we're really excited about incorporating a student in here. Because again, when we look at the data in isolation of what our students' actual lives are and realities are, we can often get dis, dis um, we, I feel we can disenfranchise them on this type of thing. We need to bring them into the discussions. Um, so I'm re we're really excited about this this process. These, this entire team works together on the program review process and supporting faculty in that program review process, which we've completely redesigned recently. Um, but again, this whole idea is that the student requires all of the the college to succeed. Um, and then how can we make sure that that, that discussions are done through all that through the entire campus um, as we go through. Do you, have, do you have an example of like one thing that uh, like an example of a gap that the teams might have looked at like we have similar teams at uh, my college, but mm -hmm. we're really focused. Um, this is the first year and it's focused on case management mm -hmm. for disproportionately impacted students. And so we're not kind of looking at data and, um, and I'm trying to wrap my head around that piece. I, I will say we have, uh, they have just started this year. So we haven't got a lot of them. I will say that right now the STEM pathway and the um, math, English and um, arts pathway are looking at the, la the low enrollment in um, math and English this year. Um, and so looking at trends on that. Um, so it's not necessarily an outcome assessment, but it's one of those um, those big data gaps that we're seeing and we're seeing, you know, what what students are not enrolling or not enrolling for math and English this year. How can we address that? Um, and so the success teams are working together on that um, to kind of look at those kind of those data elements. Um, other ones, they just went through their first review of um, program review this year. Half of the half the pathways went through program review this year. Half of them will go in the next year. Um, and so they're starting to look at the data in those and seeing what what trends there are through that. Um, so again, it's all new, but that's that's kind of what they're looking at. Yeah, we're also looking at access data and some of those other things as well. Thank you. Okay, so uh, apologize for all the text on this one slide. <laughs> a, a, story, a story to tell, um, and and actually this is a, the edited uh, down version. Uh, of course, uh, as you all, all, all probably um, who are involved with guided pathways are um, uh, familiar with that when we talk about um, the students' uh, end goal in mind, we're talking about um, direct to career or transfer, and. Uh, what we do in in nearly all of our programs is really help students um, with uh, soft skills that will help them succeed uh, in achieving uh, those end goals. And so guided pathways uh, at our college and I'm sure at, at other colleges are designing instruction with that in mind. Um, and <clears throat> interestingly, of course, uh, that's always been um, you know embedded within our institutional and general education learning outcomes. Right. And uh, at our college, our learning assessment committee uh, each year at the end of the year has um, held what uh, they refer to as these closing day events where they look at um, the institutional level data, both in terms of our, our igloos <laughs> or igloos, so to speak, and, and the achievement data. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they analyze it, there's dialogue. Uh, and after um, uh, a few years uh, uh, recently of, of doing this, they concluded that there's really a need to, to have a more pro productive exploration, more meaningful and authentic student per, uh, per student data uh, uh, to, that will enable um, examination for equity, right? And so this past uh, 
um, a fall, there was a, a, a dialogue about this and this idea of a, of a Think Five campaign. I was really trying to uh, recruit um, instructors who will, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, select um, uh, one of uh, the institutional learning outcomes for part of a of an institution wide assessment. Um, in, in terms of how um, uh, their the students are doing with respect to these outcomes, again, trying to 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 have our uh, uh, course objectives aligned in this way, uh, have uh, agreeing to a universal rubric uh, for this outcome, uh, an assignment, and that's actually um, counts in terms of the uh, course course grade and authentic assessment, uh, so that uh, at the uh, closing day, there'll be a, the ability to have um, a a look at this in terms of uh, uh, you know you know at at, a, at the same time that we're doing cultural curriculum audit, we're doing a number of other personal development activities in terms of anti racism, um, and in terms of equity, uh, you know how are, uh, what changes are we seeing right? And this is really the start of a process. It's not thought of as a, as a one-off. Uh, so there's, I think this coming spring is really gonna be the recruitment um, uh, uh, phase of it. But it, this is a, an exciting way of really trying to um, make use of the learning outcomes assessment to advance equity and to advance again, um, and, you know, help to refine um, the work we do with our institutional learning outcomes. Right, so it's really exciting. Um, and again, this and this come about from the participation of our learning um, assessment team, um, and in particular our learning assessment coordinator um, in the uh, guided pathways uh, work, and then seeing well, how does that apply in our area? And so it's been, yeah, it's so much more uh, um, wonderful uh, outcomes. Um, you know, I think uh, are in store <laughs> uh, from, from this undertaking. Are, are there any questions? I see one in the chat. So I just want to briefly, um, Craig has asked, how are you generating outcomes data for pathways? And could you clarify the infrastructure a little bit? And I think probably Jeffrey or Stephanie uh, may want to answer this one. Mm -hmm. Well, I can answer with respect to this particular example, the emphasis is on the institutional um, uh, learning uh, outcomes, the institutional general, general ed um, outcomes. So, um, I, I, we don't have a pathways-based outcomes approach. We have our course level, our program level, and our institutional um, our, uh, general ed um, outcomes. I'm not sure uh, Stephanie has um, a, a different answer. I think we're starting with bigger, um, not necessarily student learning outcomes by pathway, but we're starting out by more like um, some of the achievement data by, by pathway. Um, so we are starting to put dashboards together where you can disaggregate by pathway by students. So we just did one on like the number of people who registered for by, by pathway and which one who's missing in which pathway and with, who didn't register in which pathway. So we can kind of target um, communication to them about things. Um, we're also starting to in Starfish, um, which is what we use for a lot of our data is we're identifying everybody by pathway in Starfish so that we can then um, take data out of Starfish and disaggregate it by pathway um, as we're moving that and moving that direction. So a lot of it is backside stuff to make sure that you can actually pull data from pathways, um, but we're starting to do that incrementally as we go forward. One thing that I, I do have to uh, say, and I see the yeah. example, um, uh, thank you, Karen, for sharing that that example of sampling. You know, one of the things that I do have to say is that um, uh, we've been very fortunate uh, to have uh, a lot of volunteer support, I think, uh, across our programs. So uh, it'll be really interesting to see um, how this new um, uh, Think Five campaign um, uh, develops. I do believe it will, uh, there'll be a complement, if you will, to the cultural curriculum audit, which again, we just uh, have, have, have just launched. Um, or launching um, uh, this this spring, we I have like over thirty, maybe thirty five uh, people signed up. But the goal is to to ensure uh, we have uh, participation from from each of our departments, uh, ideally be uh, each each program, and then um, and on top of that, we will be um, uh, hoping to pursue targeted PD uh, through the work of the uh, of the CAP teams. Yeah, and sorry, I just want to address the question I'm here about. Um got to the point where, you know, st people don't see it as extra work to do outcomes. I, I that is a, a huge undertaking. I, I was the first SLO coordinator on my campus many, many, many years ago. Um, and I, and it, again, it was like, oh, we have to do something else. Like, why are we doing this type of thing? Um, I don't think we've ever gotten to the point where people love doing outcome assessments, although 
it's, so, it's sometimes fun with the data. What we've said is, you know, this is something we have to do. This is something we want to do to support our students. And this is how we're going to support you mm -hmm. in doing the work. Um, so it's it's not necessarily something that they're really excited to do, but we're going to be making sure that we support you in everything you do. And we're also going to show you the outcome of what you do to change things. Um, and so I think that's that's kind of been one of our things that we've been trying to do is more like, okay, we're going to change something. Let's let's talk about it and let's out, let's let's celebrate what you've done and also see let you see the results of what's going on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. If I can just add briefly to that, I think the kind the example of the kind of project that Jeffrey is talking about is a good way to get at some of that. If you can couple um, your assessment work really directly with instructional uh, professional development mm -hmm. and like classroom work, um, faculty tend to be more invested in it. We're doing something similar uh, with our institutional learning outcomes where we've kind of offered a hybrid of like, um, professional development around whatever the outcome is, like teaching critical thinking, right? Let's talk about teaching critical thinking and have some workshops and then also develop an assignment that you're going to use to assess it. And then also let's look at some student work that people did in response to those assignments and have some conversation about it. The um, tack I tend to use is that the, the reporting will come, right? The reporting will take care of itself if you are doing good, meaningful work. And you just have to report it. And that's the part everyone hates, right? It's the like yeah. box checking and the assessment management systems and all the rest of it. So as much as I can decouple from the sort of reporting aspect of it and just say, let's focus on instruction and like, how can we improve that instruction? And then once you do that good, meaningful work, let's report it and I'll help you do that part right? But this mm -hmm. is the part over here that matters. Um, and I find that that tends to help, although it's a slow kind of building up process, right? Mm -hmm. You start these projects with your champions sometimes, and then you yeah. do that uh, train the trainer model, and you get folks invested, and you, you move it out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say that, um, and I'm not sure how it's, how, it's, how, it's playing, how things are playing out at, at every college, I, at, you know, but I, I, I suspect at every college that there is, uh, amongst uh, quite a number of faculty, a genuine interest in doing what they can to, to advance equity and inclusion. And um, the idea that, that, that they could use learning outcomes uh, assessment to do that is something that that um, I think helps to uh, validate uh, their desire to create uh, uh, changes where they can to help their students, and at the same time helps to um, to get us uh, at at that that desire for meaningful, authentic uh, 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 learning outcomes assessment work. Mm -hmm. I think it's key. It's key is that data literacy. Because mm -hmm. if you yeah. look at the data and you understand it and you understand that there's huge gaps there, how can you not respond to those? Mm -hmm. um, and so that that often helps. But if you just like hand them a whole bunch of data and say like, oh, here, you yeah, figure it out. No. But if you have somebody walk through the data with you and say, look, it looks like you have an equity gap here. What's what's going on here or what's going on here? They're much more likely to be engaged in the conversation. So I'm going to go ahead and move us forward so we don't uh, run out yeah. of our, our time. And I'm going to speed through some of these last couple of questions um, so that we could get to maybe a little bit more discussion because the discussion parts have been great. Yeah. Thank you all uh, for your good questions. So first, just briefly, how can Guided Pathways help us re-envision assessment as student-centered? And I think the main thing, and we'll talk about this in a moment with program review, is just to include your students in your assessment processes, right? Do you have a student rep on your uh, ONA committee? Um, when you are doing these big pathways initiatives, how are you including students and their voices? So just in a quick example from my college, we've been working on our meta majors development. We are very close, a couple of weeks, uh, hope for me as we go through governance, right? Uh, but we had students that we invited specifically, and we got a van to take them to the location to come to all of our meta major summits. And they had some of the best feedback for us about you know, what the project should look like and how it should work. Uh, once we had a big draft together, we did a sort of assessment survey almost like a user testing where we sent it to them and we said try to find your major and give us feedback and like 700 plus of them filled out this electronic survey with yeah. no incentive or anything they were so excited about it right and we got some of these great comments you could see one of them here but again just be always considering where can the student voice be built into your process so that you don't lose it later like qualitative data collection student feedback on your assessment results 
results or your program reviews, student representation on all of your governance committees, and not just representation, but how do you like train and include the student reps that you do have? Because I think sometimes we sort of cycle through those reps and we don't necessarily bring them in uh, to the conversations the way that we should do, right? And they get kind of um, scared and they don't come back to the meetings because they're full of jargon and things. So like what, what kind of procedures do you have set up uh, for that? And then I'm going to zip right along because I know Stephanie has some good examples uh, related to program review. Um, so reviewing or adapting your existing assessment practices. This is the big mother load question, which is why I wanted to get to it, to create a culture of learning and improvement. This is what we're all sort of always aiming for, right? How do we get that good culture of assessment uh, on our campus? And we talked a little bit about it a moment ago in response to the good question. Uh, and one of the ways is to think about student-centered program review practices. So I want to let Stephanie talk about that. Um, OK, so as part of our um, ongoing process, we we talked about a program review as part of our program review, our, our part of our guided pathways process. And what we realized was that every we had a five year process. Everybody wrote 100 plus pages. It sat on a shelf for five years and nobody looked at it. Right. And so we're, we had a discussion about like, OK, what is what is program review and outcome assessment actually do and what do we want it to tell us um, and so I will say that we actually stopped our entire processes for one year and we said nope we're not going to continue on with this we're not going to just routinely go through this type of thing we're going to sit down we're going to ask ourselves what do we want out of this and how can we support students by doing it um, and so we actually spent an entire year looking at that um, and what we've done is we've redesigned our entire program review process and how the outcomes are aligned in there it's now a two-year process now. It's much shorter. It's much more responsive to what we want to do. Um, it includes student data in there um, and different things like that because we actually took the, the time to stop and say, why are we doing this? And that's kind of that Guided Pathways framework of like, we've been doing this thing on routine for years and years and years. And we've just been doing it because, and when, we, when it, your time came up, you wrote the 100 pages, you turned it in and you got a checkbox saying, yep, I did it or you did your assessments every year in the spring because your assessment coordinator emailed you and said, you still need to do your assessments. So you like put in, okay, yes, they did 70%. They were fine, they're le good, let's go. Um, and it became much more routine and not actually meaningful. Um, so we actually spent that time talking about what could we make it meaningful. Um, and we use that guided pathways model of designing with the end in mind to create what we wanted to look like and what we how we wanted to use it. Um, and this is where a lot of our support team stuff came out, our, design, our data coaches came out and some of those other things because we realized we couldn't do that without that support. Um, and so as we're doing these changes as we institutionally, as we go across, we're also building in the supports and the opportunities for dialogue to make sure that these things are effective and useful. Um, so I won't go through the whole slide, but I just wanna kind of highlight those, those specific ideas. All right, and we got I got us here. So we are we have five minutes, I think left uh, of our hour, uh, so that we can take some questions. But I also want to highlight for you just a few resources that we have available. So a couple of items that were referenced in the talk, and then uh, the Chancellor's Office has their Pathways Resource Library, as well as the State Senate, where you can find lots and lots of great resources, including a terrific um, Canvas course that we have been building out around Guided Pathways and around many of the topics that we've been discussing here. So I encourage everybody just to kind of check those out. Uh, I'll also highlight Ruthann has in the chat a link for you to go do a survey about this presentation if you like. So hey, give us a give us that assessment, right? Let us know yeah. how we did. Uh, and I think but assessment now we will to... actually do the survey. Yeah, right? <laughs> a now lot we of groups want won't, questions. But... So yeah. uh, please do just raise your hand. Any uh, questions or comments that you would like to add uh, for us today? Um, whilst people are waiting for questions, I just want to highlight that um, in the Guided Pathways resources is probably some really, there's some really great information in there about program review processes and making it student centered. So there's some templates, some examples, some discussions, um, and there's a great webinar that I know Sarah did a couple uh, months ago about program review processes, um, which is, which is a great resources. Yeah, and the thing I'll highlight from that is just particularly, again, for outcomes assessment folks, if you can get the assessment uh, incorporated into your program review, it's a really wonderful way to make 
meaning out of that work. Because now suddenly if, if folks can draw on their outcomes assessment uh, data and information, whether that's qualitative or quantitative in order to support requests that now have like funding tied to them and, and other things, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It becomes much more meaningful to do that work. So if you can kind of tie your assessment data to your program review requests, uh, mm -hmm. people are much more likely to kind of find that meaning, right? Well, and the other thing is that um, the reason I love the Guided Pathways framework is it gives us the permission to ask why. Why are we doing this? Why are we? Why are you doing this? Why? And ask for data and analysis and have a group conversation about why, and how can we make this meaningful? And I think that was all the the underlying of guide, of outcomes assessment in the first place. Like, why are we doing this? And is it make is it making an impact? Um, and I think Guided Pathways has given us kind of that permission to do to take that model and expand it to everything we do. Uh, Vivian, I see, has asked with program review every two years, do you also do an annual plan? So Vivian, I think all, a lot of colleges handle the cycle differently. Mm -hmm. uh, I know at our college we do annual program review, um, but not everyone does. So Stephanie, if you want to speak to that. We do um, an annual budget plan every year, but we, do, we don't do an annual plan every year for, um, we do, out, we do um, recommendations in the program review for every two years. Um, we did an annual plan every year to do your um, SLOs, but we haven't decided yet how that's going to be done because again, it was something that we did and then nobody did anything with it. So we're still asking why <laughs> um, and how we can do that and make it more effective um, so that we can get responsive on that. Because again, it was just like, we fill out this form every year and what do we do with it? It goes on Canvas or uh, at the time Blackboard and we don't do anything with it. Um, so it was that kind of discussion of like, okay, what do we do with it? And if we get it, so we actually have a, a group right now that is um, a, a task force of our budget committee and our program review committee that are actually looking at how we can report outcomes from our program review into our budget. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're going to be making recommendation again, asking why are we doing what we're doing and is, is, it, is it effective? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. We have an assessment style schedule for. Um, program review it's every two years and we do half of our programs each year um, we're trying we're changing our SLO assessment cycle which we used to be a five-year cycle according to our program review we're changing it to a two-year cycle now um, and we're actually having discussions about let's look at our outcomes and ask are they relevant are they giving us actual data that we can use um, and things like that so it's all it's all aligning into kind of this tidal wave of, of change which is great, but it's it makes people a little nervous and it makes people a little anxious. But um, I think with our program review process going so well and not requiring people to read write hundreds of pages every couple of years, um, I think people are more open to um, to to change. Yeah. So Karen also has a cycle yes. question. Yeah. Our our course we were discussing that right now is whether every course needs to be assessed within the two years. Our our estimation is yes, but we're going to see if we can reduce the number of outcomes for each one of those courses to being very meaningful and then have them change the outcomes more often as needed. Um, but again, yeah, that's a bigger discussion we're still having. Yeah, and again, I think it depends on your, your campus and what your cycles are, right? Everybody mm -hmm. has different processes for these yeah. things. So we're on a three-year cycle uh, for our outcomes. And what that means primarily is that um, each outcome that's attached to the course or program should be assessed at least once every three years. And then we give people a lot of flexibility in how they want to kind of handle that. So some folks will do, you know, their course has three different learning outcomes and they do them all at once. Some people might choose one every year and, and do an assessment of it, right? Mm -hmm. Depends on the size of the um, department, yeah. how many sections of the course they have, all those kinds of little things that I know everyone is always kind of dealing with. So we try to be flexible. We may look at that cycle uh, again pretty soon because it doesn't align really neatly with all of our other ones. Yeah. Um, but like like Stephanie, that's a that's gonna be a process um, yeah. down the road a little bit for us, yeah. I think. Well, I think the other thing is it's it's never done. Yeah. Like even if we start something, it's, it's still gonna be evolving. And that's the other thing with Guided Pathways is it's never done. Which again makes some of us a little anxious, but um, but that's what that's what it should be. It should be this evolving discussion of how it can be effective and how students can be supported in it. Okay, so I want to. We're at time, and I want to respect everybody's time. So I want to just say thank you to all of us for thank to you. all of you for joining us today. Thank you for 
to Jeffrey and Stephanie who are wonderful. Um, and if you have follow-up questions for us, um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat. I will too. Feel free uh, to send us an email or again, to check out those links on the statewide Senate uh, related to the Guided Pathways Task Force and you can contact us there. Uh, you can also request services from yes. us at the state uh, website if you like, and we will do campus visits and all kinds of things. So that's right, and and don't forget to save the chat. Yes, <laughs> and take the survey. And take oh, the right. survey. All right, and we'll hang around uh, for a couple of minutes in case people have questions as you go to your mm -hmm. next session. So thank you all so much, thank and I am going to stop the recording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.